Take a walk out here, take a deep breath, and look around. It's absolutely inspiring, and I can't help but be overwhelmed. Hi, I'm Brian Corsetti, and the raging question of our time is, how did all of this beauty come to be? Some argue that it happened through natural processes. They theorize that chaos and randomness created all this order that we see around us. But is there another explanation and purpose behind all of this? Does the scientific evidence demonstrate clear design and reveal a master designer? And if it does, what does that mean to us? Come join me on a journey to explore this beautiful world and let's see what clues and answers the animals themselves provide. I'm telling you, it's a journey worth taking. Did you know that animals played a significant role in the future of nations? Back when Rome was being attacked by the Gauls in 390 BC, the Romans were awakened by cackling geese and ended up defeating the invaders. Basically, Rome was saved by geese. Now, in another strange twist of fate, history is about to repeat itself. Summer 1780. General George Washington and his Continental Army have been waging a war of independence from British rule. He and his ragtag team of soldiers camp just outside of Philadelphia. They know the Redcoats are planning an imminent attack, but they are missing a critical piece of intelligence. They don't know when. Meanwhile, a local girl is gathering walnuts in a grove of trees when she stumbles upon a Continental soldier lying on the path, badly wounded. He's just uncovered the British plans. The Redcoats are preparing to attack with a huge army. And they're on the march now. They'll be on the path any moment. General Washington must be alerted. But the soldier is too wounded to continue on his horse. Handing the intelligence information to the young girl, he urges her to take it to General Washington. The girl grabs a big stick and jumps on the horse. She knows something the British don't. The path is lined with beehives. As she gallops along, she knocks each beehive until the bees become a big black buzzing cloud. By the time the British arrive, they're ambushed. Not by the Yankees, by the bees. The American troops were saved. It's reported that Washington told the girl, neither you nor your bees shall be forgotten when our country is at peace again. It was the cackling geese that saved Rome but it is the bees that have saved America. Wow, bees may not be saving America, but they're making life a little sweeter for all of us. 
Bees are amazing. In fact, right now, all around us, there are tiny little miracles taking place. You are now listening to the wings of a honeybee flapping at 200 beats per second. This kind of wing power helps the bee clock speeds of up to 15 miles an hour. Part of a hub of activity that makes them the most productive insect on Earth. Here's an example. Consider what kind of work goes into making one pound of honey that ends up on your kitchen table. It takes 556 bees flying a total of 55,000 miles to gather nectar from an astounding two million flowers to make a single pound of honey. This production system includes male drone bees who primarily mate and female worker bees who create wax, honey, and do most of the other work. And a bee colony can be 20 to 60,000 bees. To keep this kingdom buzzing will require a queen, and a royal job she has. She will lay an impressive 175,000 to 200,000 eggs per year. And through one of the most sophisticated communication designs ever, she will constantly get information on the condition of the hive. Pheromones, or chemicals, are passed from bee to bee, and when the report reaches the queen, she will know every detail of the kingdom. She can then lay eggs that meet the current needs of the hive. Enter this kingdom and you will see more than just pure honey. You will see pure genius. For 2,000 years, mathematicians and architects have studied and marveled at the bees' engineering skill. First, take a look at their construction technique. Bees use a six-sided polygon called the hexagon as the building block for their hives. This geometric shape provides the strongest structure possible to store honey, as well as creates the maximum amount of space with a minimum amount of material. As the bees fill it with honey, it is evenly distributed over three sides. A triangle or square wouldn't work nearly as well as the hexagon. This shape can hold the most volume and quantity of honey for the amount of wax they use and the craftsmanship of each hexagon is truly amazing. Each angle has to be mathematically precise for the comb to fit together perfectly. But there's more. Take a look at the architecture of the honeycomb. Two of the six sides are always vertical, and every hexagon tube is angled in an incline of nine to 14 degrees toward the center of the honeycomb. This tilted construction keeps the honey from spilling out. Bees are remarkable architects and brilliant engineers. They build nothing by chance. Evolution theory teaches that nature experiments until it comes up with the most efficient design. But here's the problem. If one design didn't work, say it couldn't hold honey or the nursery design couldn't keep the bees alive, the bees wouldn't be able to survive even one generation, and the species would not have survived. If the bees had to evolve a perfect design, then you would expect to have fossilized examples of early bees constructing various honeycombs that failed. But they simply don't exist. And where do they get this knowledge? All bees must have this skill from birth for the hive to function properly. Without it, they'd be doomed. Instead, Bees have this God-given ability from the beginning. The honeycomb was precisely engineered by bees with the end use in mind. Nothing inefficient, nothing left over. Evolution can't explain the honeycombs. It is nothing short of incredible. So bees are architects and engineers, but there's more. Scientists have recently discovered that bees have some pretty sweet dance moves of their own. I'm serious, it's not just for entertainment, it's how they talk to each other. When a bee finds a good source of food, she flies back home to the hive with the new information. 
First, she distributes samples of the pollen she's discovered so her audience knows what kind of flower they're trying to find. And then, she performs a remarkable dance. With this dance, she is actually giving the other bees GPS coordinates to the flower's location. Two dances are used. In the round dance, she travels in loops in alternating directions. This means the food is close by. The faster the round dance, the more the food. The figure eight dance, otherwise known as the waggle, shows her fellow bees how far they have to fly to get the food and what they will find when they get there. By the angle she dances, she's communicating which direction they need to fly and recreates the angle of the sun in relation to the flowers. How? Each bee has at least two tools that we know about. One is a built-in solar compass. This tells her where flowers are in relation to the sun. The other tool is an internal clock, which keeps track of how far she flies. So with these two tools, this incredible dance gives all of the bees precise coordinates where to find a supply of food. Now dancing bees create a dilemma for evolution. First, how did the bees develop this skill? It's a critical ability needed for supplying directions to fresh food. Evolution theory can never argue that random chaos created this complex system. It's very sophisticated communication. Communication is a two-way activity. Both parties have to understand each other. That means a bee's eyes and brain had to develop at the same time so they could see and interpret the dance. It is not likely that a bee's eyes and brain developed at two separate times. The dance is designed right into the bee, and so is the ability to understand the dance. Incredible, there's a dancing bee for you. But there's one more thing about bees that's simply remarkable, and we save the best for last. Check this out. In a research study, scientists at Royal Holloway University of London found what could be one of the most amazing discoveries ever about bees. Bees are incredible, unimaginable mathematicians. It all started with something called the traveling salesman problem. Imagine this. You're a traveling salesman and you want to visit every house in this neighborhood. Your job is to find the best route possible to all of these houses in the shortest amount of time. Sounds easy. It's not. There are hundreds of combinations, but only one is the shortest route. Now imagine you're a bee. You've entered a field of millions of flowers. Your job is to find the most efficient route to visit all of the flowers in the shortest amount of time. And oh, <laughs> your brain is only the size of a seed of grass. The mathematical calculations here are so difficult, it takes supercomputers days to do them. In the study, bees were shown to have figured out this enormous math problem. And they do it every day, and correctly every time. For the bee, math class is always in session, and scientists continue to wonder how this tiny insect can solve such huge complex problems without a computer. Scientists concluded in their study that Bees remarkably have effectively solved the traveling salesman problem. Honeybees are the only insects that provide food eaten by man. And golden honey is filled with substances necessary to sustain life, including enzymes, vitamins, minerals, and water, and provide an excellent source of energy. And honey never spoils, as its enzymes protect it from mold and bacteria. God's stunning design of bees teach us so many life lessons. Each is created for a specific purpose. They are eternal optimists, share what they've learned, and always work for the benefit of others. They are truly tiny miracles, and should remind us that so are we. 
That's the incredible bee for you, the creature that saved America. These tiny insects are a giant architect, an engineer, and mathematician, as well as great dancers. Oh, and did I mention excellent chefs? Our next animal has been misunderstood and feared for years. He's played characters and stories for centuries and more often than not played the villain. Few creatures evoked as much imagination, myth, and folklore than the legendary wolf. At one time, they were found all over the world in such diverse places like Ethiopia, Ireland, Greece, Israel, Russia, and North America. With remarkable intelligence and the ability to operate in packs, wolves are one of nature's top hunters and have no natural predators or enemies, except one, humans. And man's war against wolves over the years has been systematic and relentless. In around 800, French King Charlemagne founded a special wolf hunting force, which remained active until the last French wolf was killed in 1927. In 1500, England killed its last wolf. In 1600, Ireland was called Wolfland because it was so populated with wolves, but by 1770, Ireland's last wolf was killed, and in 1772, the same for Denmark. When Europeans arrived in North America, wolves became the most widely hunted animal in American history and were nearly extinct by the beginning of the 20th century. But North American wolves are making a comeback, and so is a better understanding of their amazing God-created design. The wolf is a top predator and can go long periods without food. But once food is obtained, a wolf can eat 20 pounds of meat in a single meal, which is akin to a human being eating 100 hamburgers in a single sitting. So what's the difference between a predator animal and a prey animal? Well, the predator's the hunter and the prey's the hunted, right? But you could tell the difference in the eyes. Predator eyes are on the front of their head with 180 degree vision, giving them depth perception as they pursue. For prey species like the rabbit, eyes are on the sides of their head, giving them 300 degree vision, allowing them a greater range of vision on multiple sides as they watch for threats and flee from them. When it comes to smell, the wolf has 200 million scent cells, compared to humans who have only about 5 million. And wolves can smell other animals more than a mile and a half away. Next to smell, the sense of hearing is the most acute of the wolf's senses. Wolves can hear as far as 6 miles away in the forest, and a remarkable 10 miles in the open. The top frequencies that humans can hear is around 20 kilohertz and dogs hear twice as high, at around 40 kilohertz. But researchers believe that the actual maximum frequency detected by wolves is up to 80 kilohertz, more than four times higher than human hearing. With a rather thin chest and powerful back and leg muscles, wolves were built for long distance running and can move over 125 miles in a single day aided with a remarkable foot design. Wolves have five toes in the front and four toes in the back. Its paws are extra wide and are slightly webbed, 
making sure deep snow hampers them less than their prey. This feature also aids them as they swim, and wolves had been known to swim as far as eight miles. Wolf legs are longer than those of dogs, and wolves walk and run on their toes, a spring design that helps them run faster, up to 35 miles per hour, and assists them to stop and turn quickly. This helps prevent their paw pads, which act like shock absorbers, from wearing down. Additionally, special bristled hairs and blunt claws work together to help the wolf grip on slippery surfaces. By comparison, if a dog had to travel in deep snow and freezing temperatures for hours, their feet would freeze. But wolves have a stunning design advantage. Special blood vessels can push blood to the foot, increasing warmth. This keeps their foot pads at just above the freezing point, which protects their paws not only from freezing, but also prevents the buildup of snow and ice on them. In a special research study published by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, researchers found that even when a foot was immersed into a frigid cold bath of minus 30 degrees, the wolf could maintain constant heat supply to the foot, preventing it from freezing. Wolves have special scent glands located between their toes. This spectacular design feature allows them to leave trace chemical markers behind with each step a highly sophisticated communication system that helps the wolf effectively navigate over large areas while keeping others informed of its whereabouts. In an article published in the Journal of Science in November 2002, scientists confirmed that all dogs, from the tiny chihuahua to the Labrador, descended from wolves. The researchers stated, the origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established. We examined the mitochondrial DNA sequence variation among 654 domestic dogs, representing all major dog populations worldwide, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. Dog breeders, using artificial selection, choose desirable traits and breed them forward, selecting for dog color, size, and temperament and over time are able to come up with various breeds. For example, if they desire the color brown, the breeders don't breed forward any of the black and white colored dogs. The breeder intentionally uses animals that have particular traits like leg length, coat thickness, and so on and so forth, and continues the process until a new breed is formed. But the important thing to observe here is that the new breeds always remain in the wolf-dog family and don't represent a transition from the wolf-dog type to another animal, say a grazing animal, like a buffalo. Evolutionists argue that the artificial selection that was used by dog breeders is replaced by unintelligent natural selection, and that by applying the magic of millions of years, virtually anything can be created. They say that animals can move from one species into entirely new ones, Fish grew legs, and later inexplicably became frogs, then amphibians became princes, and then people. This tree of life idea means that life began as a single cell and then branched out, radically changing form from one type of animal and blending into another more complicated type. But to do this, DNA and the instructions written on it would have to be added to create these new species. There is no scientific or fossil evidence to support this fantasy. No transitional forms between major groups have ever been found, and surely if they ever existed, there would be millions or billions remaining in the fossil record. So, which approach is scientific? One is clear, obvious, and observable. The other is an empty theory. It's important to note that just because an idea is advanced by a scientist, doesn't make it science. God's creation tells us another story. Fish are fish, birds are birds, and mammals are mammals, and all are created and designed with beauty and purpose, for now and for eternity.
This is the Great Gallatin Valley, just outside of Bozeman, Montana. Native Americans who lived here called this the Valley of Flowers, and a unique moment has brought together a rare gathering of the tribes. The great bison herd has moved into this valley. Each one of these charging beasts can weigh an enormous 2,000 pounds, and they are being driven by 150-pound men. Fires are lit, several fires, actually. The flames and the smoke throws the herd into a panic. The giant stampede has begun. Highly skilled Native American runners, young men specially trained for speed and endurance, put themselves in extreme danger. This tradition goes back some 2,000 years, long before horses were introduced to North America by the Spaniards. And that's why these warriors are on foot. Covered in animal skins, the runners herd these animals along a certain path. The speed grows. The ground trembles. The sound of hundreds of hooves is almost deafening. The giant stampede thunders up this gradual incline. But a surprise awaits them. Suddenly, without warning, the ground below them is nothing but air. They plunge over a precipice, 120 feet down, to their death. And hundreds of animals become food and livelihood for thousands of natives. It's called the Madison Buffalo Jump, a tradition that went on for hundreds of years and provided a bountiful harvest without firing a single shot. No other animal has had a greater impact on America's landscape and history than our next incredible creature, the North American bison. Before the 1800s, huge herds of North American bison were a matter of legend and lore. It is estimated that as many as 90 million of them dotted America's plains. For American natives, the bison was a gift from heaven. Each animal, a four-legged treasure trove, providing a wealth of raw materials. A typical bison provided around 800 pounds of meat, but that is only the beginning every part of the animal was used. The horns became spoons or scoops. The hide on top of the head became a bowl. The heart was used as a sack to carry dried meat. The bison hide was tanned and used for shelter in teepees. Hides were valuable and helped create a thriving trade. Even the stomach could be used as a cooking vessel. As the expansion of America grew, Excessive hunting and disease almost drove the bison into extinction. Bison populations went from 90 million head in the mid-1800s to a scant 551 by 1889. But thanks to careful conservation efforts, the bison is back, returning again to America's plains. A typical bison is 6 foot 6 inches high and 12 and a half feet long and can weigh up to 2,500 pounds, the largest land mammal in North America. This beast may appear slow and lethargic, but don't be fooled. When roaming wild, a bison was considered a more dangerous killer than a grizzly bear. They are not only great swimmers, but the bison can run at speeds up to 35 miles an hour, easily outpacing any human. And they have spectacular endurance, one bison on the run has remarkable stamina and can outdistance three fresh horses. Let me get something straight right off the bat. It's not called buffalo. 
Yeah, we've got words like Buffalo Jump, we've got names like Buffalo Bill, and we got food that we eat called Buffalo Wings, not to mention living in cities like Buffalo, New York, but we're wrong. The real term is bison, and bison is essentially the cousin of the buffalo. Now, the real buffalo are from Asia and Africa. You might be asking, what's the difference? Well, buffalo have larger horns, bison have littler ones, Bison have these big shoulder humps on top of their heads. Now you ever hear the term, you are what you eat? What bison eat, you could tell a lot about this amazing animal. Bison can live off food that other animals couldn't tolerate at all. They make their home on the prairies of North America and graze on its native grasses. But often when grass is less plentiful, bison will eat weeds, scrub, and other woody plants. These are tough nutrition sources to sustain an animal this size. However, this is where the bison's design excels. In the winter, with heavy snows on the ground, to get its food, it uses its massive head like a powerful backhoe, scooping down through up to four feet of snow to uncover grass on the ground below. Bison are in a class of animals called ruminants. These animals all have a remarkable digestion system that gives them an amazing advantage. It starts when the bison wraps its tongue around the grass. Then its unique lower teeth clip the grass off. This begins a sophisticated and remarkable journey into a specially designed stomach with four distinct chambers. And each one of these chambers plays a very special role to assist the bison in digesting its food. As the food travels to the first chamber, called the rumen, the process begins. This chamber is the largest and is filled with billions and billions of probiotics, or friendly bacteria. And these go to work to start the digestion process and break down the food. Next, the food moves to stomach number two, the reticulum. Stomach juices and additional bacteria now go to work breaking down the food and forming it into a semi-digested clump, known as a cud. After a bison grazes, the animal spends time resting, while specially designed muscles push the cud back into its mouth, where it is chewed and crushed. After chewing 50 or 60 times, the bison now re-swallows the food, and like a sophisticated conveyor belt, the food now moves to stomach number three, the omasum, which is lined with many folds, these folds act like a grinder to the feed. Stomach number four and last of the compartments, the abomasum. Here, the food is further broken down with hydrochloric acid, protozoa, bacteria, and other digestive enzymes. Now, finally, the animal can absorb nutrients. This amazing process extracts every last bit of nutritional protein and minerals from these primitive plant sources, providing strength to sustain the giant bison. Modern macroevolution teaches that these complex systems evolved from simpler systems over a longer period of time. But evolution can't answer elementary questions like, did the animal develop a partial stomach, then a complete stomach? And if so, how does an animal this huge feed itself in the meantime? And how did four stomachs develop? After the stomach was formed, how did the digestive juices enter the stomach? Where did the hydrochloric acid as a part of the digestive juices come from? What about its kidney and bladder? If the bison could not eat, it would go extinct, and therefore could not have evolved further. Without this system fully functional and intact, the bison simply could not survive. Clearly, evolution over millions of years could not have produced this remarkable digestive system. And what about the ancient fossil record? Evolution claims what can't be seen in real time is demonstrated in the fossil record. But does it with the bison? Scientists at Newcastle University in Northeast England studied ancient bison bones that claimed to be 55,000 years old. What they discovered was that the protein and amino acid of the ancient bison is identical to that of today's living bison. 
could such an intelligent design, sustained over thousands of years, really be credited to random chance or to a master designer? There is one final design characteristic that cannot be ignored that attests to the relationship between the Native American and the bison. How can a warrior with a simple bow and arrow or spear possibly take down a massive animal 10 times his size? There is one remaining fact that gives a distinct advantage for native hunters. A bison could be taken down with a single arrow to any part of its chest. Why? Every other mammal has two separate or plural lung cavities. Puncture one lung and the animal can still breathe. Not true with the bison. They have a singular cavity for both lungs, making it the perfect prey for Indians. One well-placed arrow or spear, like a small nail in a tire, could cause it to lose all lung capacity, collapsing and killing the giant beast. Again, this is a problem for evolutionary theory as there is no evolutionary advantage to this function at all. The Native American and his buffalo. A gift from his creator. A relationship made in heaven. As an old Lakota Indian once wrote, The buffalo gave us everything we needed. Without it, we were nothing. Our teepees were made of his skin. His hide was our bed, our blanket, our winter coat. It was our drum throbbing through the night, alive, holy. Out of his skin we made our water bags. His flesh strengthened us, became flesh of our flesh. Not the smallest part of it was wasted. His stomach, a red-hot stone dropped into it, became our soup kettle. His horns were our spoons, his bones our knives, our women's awls and needles. Out of his sinews we made our bowstrings and thread. His ribs were fashioned into sleds for our children. His hooves became rattles. The buffalo gave us everything. Without it, we were nothing. Texas, 1856. The United States Army is in the thick of the Mexican and Indian War. It's tough and getting worse. The terrain is dry and rugged. The desert region blistering hot. Water is scarce. Troops are losing strength. Even as late as the 1850s, there were still maps that uh, the interior of North America was just called the Great American Desert. In fact, anything west of the Mississippi was classified as desert. Horses and mules can only go so far. Weakened and depleted by the ferocious climate, soldiers and animals are in a losing battle with the elements. Now they're even more vulnerable to Indian attacks. The years leading up to the Civil War, the government had seen how difficult it was to supply the troops out on the western frontier. Men, horses, mules literally were dying because of lack of water. The Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, knows the Army needs a solution and needs it fast. He searches for a mode of transportation that takes little fuel, can survive the desert heat, and can handle several hundred pounds of gear. He turns to an amazing engineering marvel, the camel. Davis gets the okay from Congress for $30,000 for a quick trip to the Middle East. And here in Camp Verde, Texas, the Texas Camel Corps was born. 
it really didn't take long for the government to realize what a, a great deal the camels had been. These were animals that could exist on everything that grew in the desert southwest. They had to carry fodder for the horses, the mules, the donkeys, but the camels literally lived off of everything that grew in the desert of the U.S from prickly pear to creosote to mesquite. If it grew and had thorns, the camels actually favored it. They also didn't have to give them water, except when they found it naturally in a spring or a creek or an arroyo. Of course, the camel's main job was carrying water for the other animals, and that's where they proved their value. This next incredible creature is a remarkable cross-country 4x4. Sure, I could head across this wasteland in this trusty steed, but this animal is designed for this terrain. Meet the camel. There are two types of camels. The single-humped dromedary camel comes from the Arabian Peninsula. And the Bactrian camel with two humps is originally from Asia. Both have been highly engineered for the roughest terrain in the world. Out here, temperatures can soar to over 120 degrees, and fierce sandstorms can strike at any time. Out here, being tough isn't a matter of bravado. It's a matter of life and death. Seven feet high, Weighing 1,800 pounds and able to haul more than 400 pounds, camels can travel a range of up to 30 miles a day. And that's why the camel is known as the ship of the desert. Extreme heat, sandstorms, no water. Most mammals would die under these conditions, not the camel. In fact, the camel can go days, even months without water. How can they tolerate such extremes? Because of their special creation. Take this hump, for instance. Did you ever wonder what's inside a camel's hump? Water, an air conditioner, a spare lunchbox. It's actually closer to a spare lunchbox. A camel's hump is filled with fat, up to 80 pounds worth. It's like a reserve fuel tank for the camel. When there is no food, the hump gives the camel an emergency food supply. A camel uses fat in its hump, and over time, the hump shrinks down. In fact, a camel can lose up to 227 pounds during this process, or a remarkable quarter of its body weight. Once the camel finds food, the hump gradually grows back to normal, storing additional reserves for the future. Camels have been known to drink up to 27 gallons of water in just 10 minutes, and up to 44 gallons in a single day. The camel is remarkably efficient when it comes to absorbing water. In fact, scientists have observed that a camel can drink 20 gallons of water at one time. And in just 10 minutes, the camel's stomach is completely empty. The water first travels to the stomach, where blood vessels quickly absorb it and carry it to millions of microscopic cells to hydrate the camel. Camels can conserve water in some pretty amazing ways. Check out their nose. It may look like a normal nose, but it's actually a sophisticated moisture recycling system. A camel's nose is specifically designed to preserve moisture and recirculate it in the camel's system. How? 
The nose membranes can cool down a full 18 degrees cooler than the rest of the camel's body. So when the camel exhales the warm, moist air from its lungs, it comes out through his cool nasal passage, creating condensation. This condensation is trapped moisture that moves through tissues in their nose and back into their body. Capturing this precious moisture is an amazing and efficient recycling system to keep the camel hydrated. Camels have two lines of defense against blowing sand. First, it has thick hair in its nostrils. Those thick hairs act like a filter to keep out the sand. But if there's an extreme sandstorm, the camel can shut down its nostrils altogether. One of the things you quickly notice around the camel eyes are their bushy eyebrows. There's a good reason for that. Those bushy brows help shade their eyes from the sun and help protect their eyes from the blowing sand. The camel has three eyelids. Two of them have eyelashes that prevent sand from entering the eyes. But the third eyelid acts something like a windshield wiper on its eyes. The eyelid is very thin, so the camel can continue to see through it. When a sandstorm kicks up, the camel can close that third eyelid and just keep on walking. If sand were to get into a camel's eye, this eyelid moves side to side and voila, wipes the sand away. One of the many dangers about traveling across the desert is losing traction and getting stuck in the sand. Now, for this bad boy, these tires will do the job. But for the camel, his feet is all the traction he needs. The camel's foot is large and round, like a big plate. With broad, oversized, webbed feet like this, camels can walk in the soft sand, carrying a load of 400 pounds without sinking. Their wide feet act like snowshoes in the desert. And without them, the camel would sink deep into the sand. The desert sand can get to a searing 150 degrees, but the camel's long legs elevate them off the hot desert floor, keeping them cool. Camels are also born with thick protective skin in places that touch the hot ground, such as their knees. This isn't a callus. This is built in, as even baby camels have it. It is a design that protects them when they kneel down. Oh man, it is hot out here. It's got to be at least 110 degrees. Now, did you know that human blood is close to 94% water? If a person were to lose 5% of that water, he would go blind, lose 10% moisture, and you can't hear and go insane. And at 12%, human blood would turn to sludge and would be as thick as molasses. The heart will no longer pump and would stop entirely. Oh, and by the way, you're dead. Thanks. Scientists have discovered that the camel can lose an amazing 40% of its weight through loss of water and stay healthy. For a large camel, that can be as much as 500 pounds. The trick? Researchers have found that camel blood is much different from human blood. While the red blood cells of humans are round, the red blood cells of camels are elongated. This design allows dehydrated camels to use stored water in their tissues more effectively than any other animal on Earth. Camels are classified in the Camelidae family. So are llamas and alpacas. All of them are called camelids and are the descendants of one created kind. Evolutionists claim the camel evolved over millions of years in North America. However, the fossil record does not show how camelids evolved from non-camelids. There's no evidence to support the theory of random mutation 
it can account for the specialized equipment and the incredible design features of the camel. The camel's unique abilities and remarkable design speak for themselves. And what became of the Texas Camel Corps? By 1860, the nation's attention was on conflicts that would eventually erupt into the Civil War. The camel was all but forgotten. Camels were sold for $31 each to zoos, circuses, and mining companies. The U.S. Camel Corps had come to an end. They did with the camels here in North America what cultures, Bedouin, Berber, Tuareg, Kazakh, uh, Mongol, have done with camels for millennia. And I'm glad that we had that, if, if for a brief time on our continent. What great, colorful history. I told you, camels are one tough four by four. With their ability to use stored water, humps that help it go long periods without eating, feet that keep it from sinking in the sand, transparent eyelids and eyelashes that protect its eyes from sandstorms, a nose that can close, and elongated blood cells that allow it to safely dehydrate. It's pretty obvious to me that camels are designed to be in the desert. And despite being a little funny looking, I'd say they're one incredible creature. Is there a conflict between modern science and the belief in a creator God? With the rise of modern atheism, believers in God are written off as prejudiced and underinformed. Some even argue that science has won the war and buried the idea of God. At the heart of science lies the conviction that the universe is orderly. Without this idea, science could not be possible. So where does this foundational idea come from? The first to put it forward were the ancient Hebrews that believed the universe was created, upheld, and governed by a single God. And what was the worldview of many of the towering figures of science? Men like Galileo, the father of science, physics, and observation astronomy. Francis Bacon, who is considered to be the creator of the scientific method. Johannes Kepler, the German mathematician and astronomer. Sir Isaac Newton, widely considered to be the greatest scientist who ever lived. Albert Einstein, Pasteur, Kelvin, and most recently Dr. Francis Collins, who headed the Human Genome Project, the largest scientific project in history. He changed his view after observing the data and became a believer in God. All these can be added to a list of countless other scientists who shared a common belief in a creator God. Even more, this deep conviction was for many the driving force in their work. As Kepler pointed out, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God, and by this, thinking God's thoughts after him. Without these men, who held a conviction of a creator God, there would be no science. Science reveals the genius of God's handiwork. This is God's country. Unbelievable beauty, rugged power, and mountain majesty. 
Now, not only does it describe this country, but the animal that calls this place home. You hear that? Shawnee Indians call that wapiti or ghost deer. And it's our next incredible creature, the magnificent elk. Elk are the second largest antlered big game animal in North America, next to the moose. And they are thriving in the mountains near Gunnison, Colorado. With a background in biology, Scott Rennick is one of the area's most knowledgeable elk experts. His sprawling ranch borders the famous West Elk Wilderness, and he has spent his life working with animals. His ranch puts him right in the middle of his life's passion, connecting with the creation that surrounds him. He has joined friends in hunting camp, where their love of elk has become the focus of the week. God made elk, he did really good. And for most of the year, for nine, 10 months out of the year, where our function is elk preservation. And it's to see to the, to the best that we can, the stewardship of those animals on this ground. With his massive antlers and his iconic look, he is a sight to behold. He is clearly at home in these rugged mountains. The male elk is called a bull. An exceptional bull can weigh as much as 1,200 pounds, a statuesque king of the Colorado mountains. It is now fall, and this time of year he is forming a new herd, and his antlers tell a story. He is a healthy, vigorous animal. He will use these antlers in combat with the other bulls, all in an attempt to claim his females and form his herd for breeding. It's a dance of life. A bull will call, bluff, and show off. Anything in an attempt to persuade the females or cows to join him as he forms his new family. But his remarkable design will require this bull to form a completely new herd of cows next year a breeding feature that ensures the elk's gene pool remains undiluted and strong. Once formed, his herd will stay together through most of the year. But after breeding, this powerful stately bull takes on a surprisingly different role. A new leader emerges who's equipped with a remarkable set of abilities that the bull doesn't possess. There's a new sheriff in town, and she is called the lead cow. From this point on, she is in charge and her leadership is unquestioned. She takes lead over the herd and the entire herd, and we, we can be talking about up to a thousand animals, will follow her lead, step for step through her escapers. Where's the bull during all this time? How come he's not in the lead with her? He's in the back of the herd and he will be the one back there making sure that all the calves and all the babies and all the yearlings get over the fence before he comes on. And I find that absolutely fascinating. While elk only need about 50% of the food that a domestic cow uses, herds will travel considerable distances, led by the lead cow, in a search of food. Elk are migratory animals, and traveling gives them diverse grasses and nutrients. How far they may travel is determined by the time of the year, weather, and food sources available. This migration is vital for their survival, a spectacular design that keeps the herd healthy and strong. And who is the only one with the special knowledge or built-in GPS to locate this food? The lead cow. How does the lead cow know that she's going to take them from one place to the other and the food's going to be better there than it is someplace else? Once a lead cow becomes the lead cow and knows just exactly where to lead that herd, and it is very specific, that's where everybody goes. And there is no deviation from that route till they get to where that lead cow goes. 
even under cases of predation, even in a, a situation where the hunters will come in and disturb the movement of those cows during a given hunting season, that cow will still lead them right through that to the point where she knows the best food, the most calorically efficient food is. It's a neat deal. If you've ever walked out here, one of the things you can't help but notice are the trees. Well, they're aspen trees. The locals call them quakies because the leaves quake in the wind. Now, elk love aspen as well. In fact, they chew the bark off the trees, and you can see signs of that right here. Elk and aspen coexist in ways that just might surprise you. Aspen has a lot of carbohydrate and a lot of oil in it carbohydrate being sugar, basically. Those things they can take in the, through that ruminant system and they can turn it into products for their body. An elk will take and browse through a forest and only take a certain percentage of the uh, bark off of a quakey um, so they don't wind up destroying the tree. And they don't take the whole bark off, they only take the external bark, the outer layers, so it doesn't kill the tree. And they have a remarkable sense of how to keep a forest healthy by doing that because they will only take it off of trees that have a certain maturity. They'll only take it off of trees that uh, haven't been browsed on a lot before, and they never take more than about 10 to 15 percent of the bark off around the tree. And it's just a, it's a great system. Listen, you hear that? That's a bull elk, and he's got something to say. Like human voices, each elk has a unique voice. But to listen to a bull elk bugle in the middle of the mountains is one of the most extraordinary experiences you'll ever have. Now, I can listen to that forever. Elk are created with some amazing features that give them an incredible advantage in this rugged country. They are powerful athletes, and this massive animal can run straight up a very steep mountainside at elevations above 11,000 feet and elk can leap over a six-foot fence with ease. For two months in the summer, elk grow a summer coat. But as the cold winter approaches, their winter coat is designed to be five times warmer than their summer coat and consists of two layers, long guard hairs and a dense woolly undercoat. This combination will protect them from the extreme harsh 40 below mountain temperatures. If you split open a guard hair and look at it through a microscope, the inside looks like a honeycomb in a bee's hive. Thousands of tiny air pockets fill each guard hair, holding warmth like a down coat. And that combination makes the coat waterproof and warm. This warm winter coat is so thick, it can prevent snow from melting on an elk's back. What triggers the growth of this winter coat is not the decreasing cold temperatures as many think, but the decreasing light during the days of the fall season. This is also called the photo period, and it is the very same thing that causes leaves to fall in the autumn. While their coat keeps them warm, elk's superior sense of sight, hearing, and smell keep them safe in the forest. cow type animal like an elk or a deer see in a marvelous pattern around them. I believe it's 260 degrees around themselves, but they have no binocular vision, which they, means they have no depth perception. They're also, their eyes are extremely well adapted to detecting motion, but they can't really distinguish the, the immediate differences in shapes. A man can sit at the base of that tree and if he doesn't move and the elk can't smell him, the elk will walk right by. I've had them within nine or 10 paces of me. And they'll just walk right by and not even know you're there. But if you flicker so much as a fingernail, they will just fly off because they've seen the motion. They know that's not a natural motion for that spot. They put two and two together and they're gone. And they'll take the whole herd with them if, if they're in a herd situation. They can smell things from what we would consider really long distances. Their hearing is extremely acute. They can pick up differences in noises. Elk are considered a primary indicator species, 
which means if the elk are healthy, then so is the environment they live in. And Colorado's elk population of around 300,000 are thriving. A key reason, Colorado's managed hunting. Hunters often get a bad rap, but play a critical role when it comes to the success of the elk herd. How can you love animals and hunt them, some ask. Hunting for food goes back to the beginning of time. And these Colorado hunters play a critical role in keeping Colorado's elk herd vibrant. Most years, as winter rolls in, snow covers the ground. These harsh conditions limit the food supply and left unchecked would cause famine, weakening the entire herd. Hunting culls the elk population, reducing the herd, provides food for hunters, and guarantees the rest of the herd have plenty of food allowing them to thrive through the winter. And research shows that hunters have a deeper admiration and appreciation of animals because hunting puts them closer to the food chain. Scott and his friends are ethical hunters and live by a strict code that honors God's creation and the food he provides. The first thing we do is we pray over that animal because we feel that we have been given something and we need to show the respect and the love and the, and the admiration that we not only have for that animal but for the creator who made it and made us and it a part of the system. And so the prayers are heartfelt. I've seen it change people's lives like nothing I've ever seen before. I've been to church a lot, not as much through my whole life as many people, but I have seen that act change people's lives. There's times in life you just have to have faith. I never thought that I would be in this position to have this opportunity. I've been given this opportunity. We're doing the best we can with it. It's a soul-searching, incredible experience every single day to wake up up here and to be able to be a part of this, this environment. The magnificent Rocky Mountain Elk continue as a living testament in these mountains a testament for the generations to come of the unbelievable beauty, power, and majesty of their creator. I want to leave you with one more creature that really amazed us. Now, it's tiny and common, but they're everywhere. It's the little cricket, and we may have just saved the best for last. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John pens a description of an amazing scene seems to take place after Jesus Christ's crucifixion and resurrection into heaven. It reads, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. This incredible scene of a vast array of creatures, large and small, singing praise to God, was the inspiration for Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. And it is said that this scene so gripped Handel that he never looked at life on this earth the same way again. For over 2,000 years in China, before the Tang Dynasty, ancient Chinese have collected and enjoyed crickets. In one recorded account, dated back to 742 AD, it was written, Whenever the autumn arrives, the ladies of the palace catch crickets and keep them in small golden cages, which were placed near their pillows, so as to hear their songs during the night.
For centuries, crickets were caught by the Chinese and put into beautiful decorative containers and brought inside, a custom that continues today. In the spring, the insect's song told them when to plant, and in October, its song encouraged the ladies to expedite their weaving efforts of warm clothes for the coming winter. But there is more to the cricket song than the Chinese could ever know. Recently, a recording engineer on a starry night recorded crickets in his backyard. And this is the sound he captured. Crickets have a short lifespan of only about a year, and they chirp using very high frequencies. Many of these so high that as humans, we can't really hear them all. So the engineer tried an experiment. What would happen if the cricket's fast-paced life was slowed down to match the lifespan of a human, and its chirps and song frequencies lowered to a level that we as humans could all hear better? Well, what he uncovered was remarkable, and we are glad to bring it to you. You will hear two audio tracks. The first is the recording of the normal cricket singing into the night. And now over the top, we will add the slowed track. And in the tradition of Handel, we simply call it the cricket chorus. What lies behind the universe is no abstract. It is God, the creator and master designer himself. God has left creation as a beautiful song, a call to each human heart to leave the rebellion and be reconciled to him through his son, Jesus Christ, who offers the gift of forgiveness and a way back to God. Only then can the unique melody of your life join the chorus of creation in giving honor to him. The book of Genesis starts off with a simple truth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Each of these animals that we looked at today shows beauty, order, and purpose, a reflection of the creator who made them. So what does this mean for you and me? We too are an incredible creation. God has created each of us for a great purpose, and when we realize that, we bring honor to him. I'm Brian Corsetti, and I'll see you next time.